Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We ask that you would draw us close today on this special Sabbath day. So thankful for your love for us that you gave your son a sacrifice, a ransom for our sins. And we invite your Holy Spirit now to be with us and guide us in our thoughts of the love of God. We thank you and we praise you and we glorify your name. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's praise the Lord in song. 474, take the name of Jesus with you. Worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And loose offering that's collected today will be given to the local church budget. Uh, our offering appeal is by Heather Thompson Day writes, Sometimes when I am given a task to do, it can be hard for me to keep focused on it. When writing a book, sometimes I get what's called writer's block. When the words just don't come as easily to me. When I'm writing an article or a message to share, it can be hard too. One thing that helps me immensely is leaning into my team of family and friends. My husband is an excellent encourager and he provides me with the support and space to complete the job. My friends hold me accountable by asking how different projects are going. Similarly, our church functions only because of many people working together as a team to keep our ministries running. Several volunteers help with things such as Sabbath school, ministry meetings, and leading out prayer meetings, just to name a few things. The Bible tells us that thus the same one sows and another reaps is true. Each person serves a different yet important role to help the church function. Today's offering will go to support our local church budget. There are many ways to support what our church does, and giving financially is just one. Pray and consider how God can use you to continue to move forward in the mission of our church. Deacons, come forward. <clears throat>
Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the ministry of this church. I ask that you would guide us and direct us and bless us with your Holy Spirit. Give us direction where we might follow you to show the love of Christ to others. Bless these tithes and offerings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to see each of you here today. I know we have family here, and that's always great to see family, and we have church family here, and we're all God's children. So it's a blessing to be in his house on the Sabbath day and to have each of you here. A couple of announcements before we go to our prayer request. Uh, next week, our conference president, Vic Van Schaik, I guess, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to say that last part of his name, but anyhow, he's going to be here, and we will have a fellowship meal. That means, yes, mark it on your calendars, three in a row, counting this Sabbath, we will have three in a row fellowship meals. The guys are loving it. Some of the women are saying, oh, no, not that. You know, I love it, and I, I made the food that we're having today from our household since Sherry worked yesterday, and yes, I made the roast just for you, Sharon. Uh, Sherry did help, though. Anyhow, uh, so we will have a fellowship meal next week, and we'll have our guest speaker. You can see when our next board meeting is. We will have our Bible study on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here at the church, and then also our Bible study at the High Rise next Friday at 7 o'clock. Uh, we do have our Zoom prayer meeting, and... Uh, if you want to join us on that, all you have to do is sign up here earlier, said Ask Steve or Diana. If you ask me, I'm going to refer you to Diana because she's the expert on those things. But it's very easy, and we do bring the prayer requests that we mentioned today to that prayer time also. Also a reminder, last week uh, we were told about the school calendars, and Sherry has the, the envelope for that. And this is the last chance if you're interested in getting one of those calendars. It's full of, I believe, nature pictures, Bible verses for each month. And then uh, the proceeds go to help the church school. We are very blessed to have a church school in our district. And for some of those who don't know, it's actually a, a, a combination of efforts for about five or six churches in the in the area, our our churches in our district, and those in Bedford or Bedford's part of our district, but Bloomington, Ellettsville, Martinsville, and Spencer. So a number of churches helping with that, and I forget now. I believe they have 11, 12, 13 students, something like that. The Lord has definitely blessed. And the nice thing is, well, it is a nice thing because it's young children mostly, which means that's years of, of schooling that will still be taking place. And uh, it's, by the grace of God, just going to grow. You can see there, there's a special weekend for the women there in October for those who are interested in that. And I think everything else you can pretty much read. So now is our time for our praise and prayer request. And, you know, uh, it was interesting. Sherry said, well, you should have someone talk about what has happened at, at the, the booths this week. And the first couple of days, pretty slow. But Jim brought me a prayer request. He said there was a little boy, didn't give his name, that asked that we would pray for his dad. So we don't know. The Lord definitely knows that little boy in his heart and knows the dad and the situation. Uh, we want to definitely take that prayer request before the Lord today. We have other prayer requests for children and grandchildren of our church family, for Mary, uh, for my mom, who's been getting over a, a virus. It wasn't COVID, but still Feeling bad, Daryl, good to see you here. Daryl did have the COVID a couple few weeks ago, and we're glad he's better. Um, our church worldwide and our witness that Jesus is coming soon. Um, 
for Karina. Lynn hasn't been able to get a hold of her in about a week now, and she's going to be starting some therapy here in September. Here, well, this is September, September 16th, so it's coming up. Johnny, Ron's brother, who uh, had a urinary tract infection and fortunately didn't get worse, and he's recovering from that. Diane, who's starting Bible studies. She's following the studies that we've been doing on Tuesday night, or she has copies of that and is going to start following those. And we want to continue to keep Debbie in our prayers for encouragement at the high rise. Um, Alice, who many of you know, has passed away a while back. Her daughter, Mary, that we met at Alice's baptism, and then we may have met her again at her funeral, She's got a lot of health issues going on, and she's asked that we would keep her in prayer. Continue to pray for Ryan, and also Debbie's mentioned again, and for all of our church families, I want to remember to keep the, the people affected by the shooting in Georgia in our prayers in that situation. Yes? Okay, that's right. Uh, is there any Millers? Okay. I'm, when I think of Millers, I think of the different Miller family. I didn't know their last name, but anyhow. Yes, we had been praying for Laura, who was on hospice, and she passed away this, yeah, last Sabbath. Uh, I know there's probably others. We want to continue to keep Freddie's... Um, nephew in our prayers in that family continue to pray for our outreach it's going on even now as i speak there at the the fair and then also the apple festival coming up in october another opportunity yes nancy Yes, I think she did that one of the first days. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I don't know if yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's nice that people gather our information, going to share it with others. You know, someone was telling me, I, I think it was Diane was telling me how someone found a a Bible study card to be filled out in the dirt and uh, randomly found it, cleaned it off, sent it in, and did Bible studies. You know, the uh, Lord works in amazing ways. We forget his ability to use our feeble efforts for great things, and we just continue to pray that... Uh, he will continue that work in spite of our feeble efforts, and this gospel will go out. So, all right. And again, I know there's probably prayer requests that haven't been put down, whether it be for family members, coworkers, whatever it might be. We will keep those in, in mind, too. At this time, for those of us who can, we'll kneel as we go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to, to be in your house again this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for your bountiful blessings to us, for your watch care, Lord. We thank you for the health and strength that we have, that we can be here today. Lord, you've heard the prayer request. I want to emphasize the little boy who asked for prayer for his dad. Lord, you know the names, you know the situation. 
and I know that you love them. And I just pray that your spirit would envelop that young boy and his father and that your, your work, you who has begun the work and will finish it, will work on their lives. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity for the outreach and for the literature that's gone out, the contacts that were made. Lord, sometimes it, we feel like we're just treading water and barely keeping ourselves afloat, but we forget who you are and how you will use our feeble efforts that seem so little to spread the gospel and pray that that we will be encouraged to continue to spread the gospel by whatever means. Lord, I pray that you would be with each one that's here today, that they will be blessed this worship time and, Lord, in the fellowship that we will enjoy after. I pray, Lord, that you would be with the prayer request, each one that were mentioned, for those that are dealing with health issues, Lord, for those who have become discouraged and are missing today, I pray that they will be back. Lord, I pray that you would be with the children, the grandchildren, everyone represented here. Lord, those unspoken requests, we place them before your throne and ask for your intervention and your answer. Lord, I pray that you would be with the process of, of bringing a pastor to our district. I pray, Lord, for patience as we wait. Lord, bless now this service that all that's said and done will be to your honor and glory. And Lord, may we each be faithful to you until the day that Jesus comes to take us home. And Lord, may that day be soon as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This time our message is going to be given to us by John Bradshaw via a video. Getting through the world's toughest times is the title of this presentation. I know that the Lord will bless. If you were to look at <clears throat> a map of Minnesota, and I were to ask you to put your finger on about the middle of nowhere. Now in Minnesota, there's a lot of the middle of nowhere. But one place you might put your finger is on or near the town of Hinckley. Hinckley, Minnesota is about halfway between the cities, the Twin Cities and Duluth, which sits up there on the lake. It was an old railroad town. Uh, in fact, Hinckley, the name Hinckley, uh, comes from the name of uh, the president of one of the railroad companies. So it was named after a railroad company president. In the 1890s, 1894 particularly, the summer was hot and dry, really hot, really dry. And it wasn't a surprise to anybody in that place that was thick with forestry that there might be forest fires. And the people of Hinckley knew that there were fires around about and they did not want to be reckless and they did want to be proactive and so they made preparations in case a forest fire would come to near where they are would come to near where they were in case a forest fire came by and so here's what they did you can't fool around with forest fires so they did not they secured a hose they had a hose there when i say the people of Hinkley, I'm really talking about the lumber mill because at the lumber mill, there were tens of millions of board feet of bone dry lumber, bone dry. This was a catastrophe waiting to happen. 
And the good people of Hinckley didn't want a catastrophe to occur in their place. And so they had a hose there at the lumber yard and they filled a dozen hogsheads with water. Hogshead was a barrel, a barrel that held about a, a hundred gallons. And so they very carefully uh, prepared by putting aside 1,000 or so gallons of water and they had the equivalent of a garden hose. And that, they hoped, was going to help them should a forest fire come near. Well, a forest fire did not. Two fires joined together to create a ferocious firestorm. And there were the good people of Hinckley with a thousand gallons of water as their defense. You know that the average backyard swimming pool contains about 20,000 gallons of water. And they had 5% of that amount. They had the equivalent of five water beds. They had the equivalent of about 25 bathtubs. They had the equivalent of about three teenage showers is what they had. <laughs> How in the world was that going to resist a forest fire? Surely it was not. As September arrived, so did the Great Hinkley Fire, and it was massive. You know, fires that big create their own weather systems, and the weather does some strange things, and the fires themselves do strange things. In fact, gases from the material, from the, the trees, will accumulate in the air, and sometimes they don't burn off. So you'll have these giant bubbles of gases that get carried ahead of the fire on the winds. So you can be way ahead of the fire. The fire can be way back there. You can look up and see that the sky is literally on fire when those gases ignite. The fires do strange things, fires that big. The winds whip up like crazy. Oddball things take place. And the heat, the heat during the Great Hinkley Fire, it was about as hot as lava. That's hot. Barrels of nails melted in the rail yard. The wheels on some of the trains fused together with the tracks. That's how hot this thing got. Many people died. Many of whom died while dragging their possessions in trunks behind them through the streets of Hinckley. Many of those who did not die either escaped by train. And you can read this story. It's a gripping read. Escaped by train, what was a harrowing experience. They were lucky to get out at all. Well, blessed, we won't call it lucky. Others hid in ponds or in a river. Many others lay in open fields. They covered themselves in water-soaked blankets. One young girl was underneath one of these blankets, and I don't know all of the situation, but the wind started whipping around, and the little toy that she had in her hand was, was snatched out of her hand by the wind. She instinctively stood up and ran towards it to retrieve it. And as she did, as her mother watched, she caught fire. That's how hot it was. And she was reduced to a small blackened mass before her mother's eyes. A scene which was repeated many, many times. Officially, 418 people died. 418. Reports say the number was definitely much closer to 500. The fire like that is truly devastating. But the problem was the people prepared, but they were underprepared because they didn't truly appreciate how serious this fire could possibly be. Are you hearing me today? Planet Earth is heading towards a similar calamity. Malachi wrote of a day that would burn as an oven. Paul wrote that that wicked would be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. There is a serious day ahead. I don't mean a frightening day, a serious day. The truth is, what's coming to planet Earth is a glorious day. Jesus is coming back to this earth. But associated with the return of Jesus is a small constellation of events of which we would do well to be mindful. Now, we've been told a storm is coming, relentless in its fury. We understand that. <clears throat> and I, wrote, I read, rather, where the servant of the Lord said, 
you can often anticipate how bad something is going to be ahead of time. But this, you cannot anticipate. Friend of God, the inspired writer Daniel said that we are heading towards a time of trouble such as never was. We never seen anything like that. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 said, therefore, be ye also ready. How do you get ready for something that you cannot anticipate? Well, you do. And according to the Bible, one of the greatest challenges facing believers in these last days of earth's history is not a lack of knowledge, even though we know my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's not necessarily a lack of willingness. Lord, Lord, haven't we done wonderful things in your name? But if you will read the Bible, you will discover that one of the greatest challenges facing believers, what I say? Believers in earth's last days is apathy. Apathy. Scripture tells us so. The ten virgins, five were wise, five were what? Yeah, but all ten were, all ten were asleep. Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, come on, I'm going to go over there to pray. You stay right here and watch and pray. Watch with me. I need you to be here. I need you to be here. Jesus went off and they slept. They knew the Messiah told them, this is important. And yet they slumbered and slept. All of them. Jesus came back, woke them up. They fell asleep again. He came back, woke them up. They fell asleep again. Finally, Jesus said, go on, keep on sleeping. In the book of Revelation, addressing the church of earth's last days, Jesus says the church of Revelation, the church of Laodicea is lukewarm. Now, when you come with us to Laodicea, you will discover that near Laodicea is another Bible town of Hierapolis. It's just up there. You can look up towards Hierapolis and see these great white terraces caused by the minerals in the hot water that bubbles out of the ground. Now, just east of Revelation, right next door, is Colossae. Colossae's water didn't bubble out of the ground as hot water. Their water came to them. It was mountain fed. Around that area are mountains that get up to about 8,000 feet tall. And so you know that the water that came down from the mountains to Colossae was cold, really cold. And the church of Laodicea, listen, friend, the church of earth's last days, and I'm not talking about the liberals, and I'm not talking about the cranky conservatives. Laodicea, that would be you. Jesus says, you're not hot like the water that came out the ground up there in Herapolis. You're not cold like the water that came down from the mountains and, 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 and satiated the thirst of the people of Colossae. You're somewhere in between, not hot, not cold. We, the Bible declares, are lukewarm, and that ought to sober us up. There is a storm coming, relentless in its fury. You know, with people of Florida face this all the time, and a hurricane will, will, will burst through, and you know what happens. Some will board up their doors and board up their windows and batten down the hatches, and the damage for them is minimized. But those who escape town and say, it's probably not going to be much, will come back to ruination. They knew there was a hurricane coming. By now, we all know how devastating they can be. The question isn't, did you prepare? Everybody prepares. But did you prepare adequately? Jesus is coming back soon. It is not going to be the teddy bear's picnic between now and then. Serious business during which time it's not so that we can go through hell and be burdened down and be miserable. This is designed so that the glory of God might be revealed. The goodness of Jesus might be manifested. The power of the Holy Spirit will be on display. God says, I've called you for that. You could have been born in the 900s BC, 900s AD. You could have been born in the 1700s or the 1800s instead. It was not an act, a, a twist of fate that allowed you to be born so you could be alive for such a time as this. My friend, God wants to use you to show the universe what God can do in a life. This doesn't come by osmosis. We don't sleepwalk our way from here to there. 
We are to be prepared. Prepared. The church of Laodicea, Laodicea said, We are rich and increased with goods. We have need of nothing. And they were rich. When an earthquake leveled Laodicea in, I think, 17 AD, the Roman emperor said, We'll rebuild. They said, No, we're fine. We don't need your money. We'll do it ourselves. They were rich. And Jesus said to the church of Laodicea in earth's last days, you think you are rich and increased with goods that have need of nothing. But you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. This isn't a pretty picture. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Jeremiah said the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And so we were the hearts that we cannot tame. Hearts that we cannot straighten out have been called to live in earth's last days. We have been called, you don't hear this in church. We have been called to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator in the heavenly sanctuary. This is a singular, unique experience in the history of the world. Now, don't misunderstand me. We have not been called to live without a Holy Spirit. Oh, no. But without a mediator, and are we living thinking of these, the, the, are we cognizant of the importance of these times? Or do we imagine we can sleepwalk our way to the kingdom? Friend, we cannot. You have noticed that society is in upheaval. The economy is an absolute house of cards. Social standards down the drain. Half a century after Dr. King had a dream, you would think he never even existed. Such are the forces trying to tear us apart down here in Earth's last days. We are seeing decisions made at the governmental level. I'm not trying to be political, and so don't listen politically. But we are seeing decisions made. We are seeing companies act in ways that we've never seen. I mean, not in this society, never seen before. And unfortunately, we've been, it seems, anesthetized against much of the reality that's going on around us. You just kind of get used to it, and it doesn't shock you anymore. And you see rights being trampled, and you see certain things taking place, and we just end up doing the emoji thing and imagining that it's all okay. Well, it all is not. It's simply not. What we are seeing in the world is a wake-up call. Listen, friend, I said this before. You've heard it before, but I will say it again. We used, to what we used to preach the Mark of the Beast sermon and have people say to us, okay, I get it, I understand, I believe it, I see it, but I don't know how that could happen. You are telling me that the whole world is going to coalesce around a single issue. How's everybody going to know? So if you're keeping this or you're keeping that, how are people going to know? Who's going to keep watch? How... Nobody asks that question anymore when we preach about the mark of the beast. Nobody. Because now everybody knows that you can go from a what is the coronavirus to lockdowns all over the world in about that long. And friend of God, I mean no disrespect when I say this. I understand that COVID has been absolutely devastating. But given the big picture, COVID's a relatively small issue. You could avoid it if you wanted to. Just go dwell on a mountaintop, wait for it to pass by. You can get away from it if you want to. Isolate, lock your door, do your thing, wait it out. If you want to, you can keep away from it. You understand what I mean when I say that. What is coming, you cannot avoid. No mountaintop is high enough. No distant place is distant enough. It is coming to every last one of us. As I said before, a storm is coming relentless in its fury. We can't escape this. It's going to be the real thing. And we learned that the world can go from nothing to everything just like that. People from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, all they were talking about was this virus. Just, it was a serious issue, but there are more serious issues coming. And this has got to wake us up. And let me say this while I'm out there. Friend of God, I believe that for the church, COVID was a great opportunity. 
a great opportunity. We all learned words. Now, the medical people knew these words before, but dummies like me, we'd never heard of comorbidities before. Now, when they mentioned it, we nodded and, 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 oh, yeah, like, and then we Googled, what in the world? You know what the health message was given to the church for? To help people avoid or get over their comorbidities. That's what it was for. This was an opportunity for us to stand up and say, we can help. But unfortunately, we were like Isaiah's dumb dogs that could not bark. What in the world happened to us? And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, along came a confusing issue. And some said, this is the end of the world. And others said, this is nothing. And some said, you better get a vaccine or we're going to boot you out of society. And others said, you don't need a vaccine. And in our own churches, we fought like cats and dogs. God help us. You're going to argue about COVID. Uh, no, I'm not saying one must not have a different opinion from another. We must. We're thinking human beings. We're sentient. We ought to be able to think this thing through. You're going to see it one way. I'm going to see it another. But aren't we brothers and sisters at the end of the day? Huh? The unity that exists in the church is our testimony to the world that we believe Jesus is the Son of God. And we demonstrated over the last year, we are not convinced of that fact. And if COVID's going to rent us asunder, ladies and gentlemen, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because what's coming, when it becomes a matter of life and death, when you are staring down the barrel of a gun, and I say that metaphorically, sort of, when it is, you are going to be canceled, canceled, canceled. Now, it was one thing. You had to wear a mask to the supermarket. They had to, this was great fun, wasn't it? They made you stand six feet apart in line like that was going to accomplish much of anything. They made us jump through all these hoops. No, one day... No buying and selling. Oh, wh wh when do I get to go to Trader Joe's? You don't. Oh, wh wh wouldn't I mean not ever? Never. You're done. And you know, cancel culture has demonstrated to us, people are happy to eliminate you from the general run of things. Happy. They think it's their right. They're virtuous. Canceling you because your view doesn't uh, correspond with the mainstream. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID was an opportunity. We fumbled it. God is going to bring us more opportunities. We must not fumble. Now, again, again, I've got to be careful here because someone's going to misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying that in COVID we had a responsibility to set the world straight and tell them about the evils of vaccines or the positivity of, I don't mean any of that. I mean, the world was in crisis. It was time for us to put the sign outside our church. We can help. We have the answers. We know how you can face this with more confidence through our health message and through our salvation message in Jesus. Man, things changed and we were caught flat-footed. We mustn't do that again. I'm speaking generally. You know I am. And you know I'm generally right. Maybe even more than generally on, on, on this is what I'm talking about. It was a wake-up call, friend. A wake-up call. Do we not see how serious this thing is? Do we not understand how, how cataclysmic the challenges of earth's last days are going to be? We must see God in his mercy gave us a dry run. And he said, you get it now. I've been telling you for thousands of years, a time of trouble such as never was. And here we are. This was not factional. This was not sectarian. This didn't happen in some little part of Europe or some wee country in Africa. This was global. The terms of engagement have been rewritten now. And we are in this thing deep. Well, let's go quickly. Book of Amos. God shows us how important it is to be awake. Amos opens with God pronouncing judgments upon the nations surrounding Israel and Israel. And he says this, he says in Amos, uh, 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 I have brought judgments to you. Food was scarce. And then he says, yet you have not returned to me. Huh? Listen, he says, I kept the rain from falling. Yet you did not return to me. We've got droughts out west. Have you seen, isn't it Lake Mead? An area seven times larger than Manhattan 
was underwater, but there's so little water, that is all dry land now. We're talking about a colossal area. People out west, I'm talking to a farmer recently, a man who grows crops. He said, they're going to take our water away. I said, if they take your water away, there'll be no crops. We'll start to starve. He said, they're going to take our water away. We're in a crisis right now. God said back then, I kept the rain from falling. You didn't return to me. You, 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 can, you can go ahead and blame global warming if you want. Blame it all you want. And, and, and I don't think you can get away with polluting the atmosphere uh, wantonly and not paying the price. I'm sure there has to be some kind of kickback, surely. But you can blame, you can blame global. Years ago, we blamed El Nino. You never hear of El Nino now. Then it was La Nina, kind of fell out of fashion. Now it's global warming. Uh, you, you sh okay, say what you want, but I tell you what to blame, and that's sin. And that's a lack of repentance and a lack of prayer because God said of my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. What did he say? I will heal their land. This is just a reflection of the abject spiritual poverty our nation is experiencing right now. And God's people are called to pray when judgments come. We are to return to God. The judgments are not a reflection of a lack of mercy on God's part. This is God saying, I don't know how to get through to you people. You've junked the Ten Commandments. Christian churches brag about how they've done that. Morality isn't even a thing anymore. They're euthanizing. They're aborting. So, so before they born, they're euthanizing him. And when, uh, sorry, they're aborting him. And when they're old, they're euthanizing them. And God is saying, what? Of course there will be judgments because I want you to turn to me. I want you to reconsider this, the stupidity and the destruction of your ways. Food was scarce. I kept the rain from falling, yet you didn't return to me. I sent pestilence among you, overthrew some of you as Sodom and Gomorrah, but you still didn't return to me. God was saying the trouble, the judgments were an invitation to return to him. God was not being tyrannical. God was being merciful. In Amos chapter 5, seek the Lord and you shall live. Seek the creator and so forth. And then from verse 18, woe unto you that, listen, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Now we all desire the day. Seventh day Adventist. We got it in our name. We desire the day of the Lord. Whoa. Now understand, Amos was written to a certain group of people at a certain point in time. But we understand too that all those things were written unto them for our admonition upon whom the end of the world occurred. Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and was met by a bear. He went to his house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, no brightness in it? I hate, God says, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt, you know, I, I just feel I got to say this. You, you, you know, I know the Sabbath is not a feast day. You ever heard it said that we're going to have to experience the Sabbath more fully? The Sabbath more fully. And you know what's happening in churches and homes on the Sabbath. From sea to shining sea, I am talking to you. If you are loose about the Sabbath, if the Sabbath is an hour in church and then two hours at Cracker Barrel, which is a sin, by the way. That's Sabbath breaking. People were stoned for that in Old Testament times. We're not advocating a return to that. This is a different dispensation. We understand that, but that is serious in the sight of God. Oh, God bless you. Happy Sabbath. See you at the restaurant later. See you at the ball game later. We'll be going to do the movie later and going to hell later. Who not, who's going to tell you if I don't? You know it's true. And God says, God bless you on your little Sabbath feast days, but that's not anything for, for me, obviously. That's for you. You're doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Come on, man. You've heard that, Sid. 
We got to be Christians. We call ourselves Christians. If you're a Baptist, go be one. Just go be one. If you're, if you're a Sunday keeping Adventist, go be one. I mean, God loves you. He'll love you then. He may not, he may not save you. I don't know, but he'll love you. Be, be what you be. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, be one. When I grew up, I, 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 my, my earliest recollections is putting on a black jersey. Had these white V's here, a couple of white hoops on the arm. I was five years old. I was playing rugby league across the gully from the home in which I grew up. And I knew that once you got on that team, you listened to the captain and you listened to the coach and you played by the rules. If you don't want to pick up the ball and run with it, you want to kick it around, you go around there and play soccer because that's soccer. Huh? If you don't want to do any of that, but you just want to go to the river and swim, you go to the swimming club, not here at the rugby league club. If it's not the Bible, it's not the Bible. We don't want it. We want to honor God. We want to serve the Lord. We want to go to heaven. We want to walk on streets of gold. Jesus died for us. And so we honor him by our fidelity to him and our fidelity to the word of God. You don't want to do that. Don't do that. But don't bother the rest of us. Off you go. We will love you. We'll love you. It's your right. It's not your right to stay in the church and raise hell. That's not your right. God help you. God help all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, God says, I despise your solemn feasts. No, no, no. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. That's not legalism. That's faith. Righteousness by faith. Because faith is grabbing hold of the word of God and expecting it to do what the word of God says it will do. So we obey out of love for Jesus. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I won't accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I won't hear the melody of your vials, your stringed instruments. Whew. You desire the day of the Lord, but it won't be light. It'll be darkness. Come on, man. You can see a parallel, can't you? Today, we talk of the return of Jesus as we should. And the Bible tells us that from among our own selves, people will say to us, Lord, 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 Lord. And Jesus will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The second coming is going to be the greatest moment in the history of the creation since the creation of the world. The dead in Christ are going to be risen, raised from their dusty beds. The lost will be gone. The kingdoms of this old sinful world will be swept away. There'll be and never be another case of COVID or the flu or diabetes or heart disease. Never, never, never. There'll be no more injustice, no more racism. There'll be no more crime. There'll be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. The former things will be passed away when Jesus comes back. What a day. What a day. But as God said through Amos, there are many people who are desiring that day. But for them, it won't be light. It will be darkness. It's got to be like a man running from a lion and hello runs into a bear. You get to the sanctity of your own home, the, the sanctuary of your own home. Put your hand on a wall. You got bit just like that. We can't have that. There are people who are expecting something wonderful, but instead will receive a rude awakening when the day of the Lord returns. They are prepared. Look at them in their well-pressed shirts, their beautiful dresses, their fine suits. Look at them with their polished shoes, carrying their Bible under one arm and extending the other to shake the hand of the greeter at the door. Look at them saying, Amen and Happy Sabbath. Look at them licking the tithe envelope, placing it in the offering plate. Look at them. We look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Our preparation for the coming of the Lord has got to go beyond the externals. I'm speaking to myself this morning. We must bring to Jesus purified hearts. And friend, if it isn't pure, you bring it to him. If tomorrow it's not pure, you just keep bringing it to him. It's not whether or not you screw up along the way. It's whether you will fall in the direction of Jesus that matters. Amen. Jacob diddled his dad, ran for his life, felt rotten about it. Puts his head down on a rock to sleep. And he's, what does God do? He gives him the vision of the ladder. Man, this cat was a wretch. He'd done a terrible thing. And what God does is give him a dream to assure him, I'm not done with you. So if we're failing, God's not done with us. 
If we're stumbling, God's not done with us. If we have some growing to do, we keep on growing. We keep on bringing our heart to Jesus. You gotta do something about my pride. You gotta do something about these terrible thoughts that swirl around inside my head. You gotta do something about the stuff other people don't see. Lord Jesus, you have said that you would create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. You gotta do it. We've got the externals all figured out. We know what day of the week. We know 457, 1844, and that's the truth, by the way. We understand the health message. We quibble about some of the details, but we understand the health message. We got that. We understand the 1260 days, the 1290 days, the 1335 days. We have got it. Well done. But what about your heart? You might just be like the people of Hinckley. Here comes a wall of fire. You got a thousand gallons. You got 25 bathtubs full of water. Congratulations. Won't make a dent in nothing. Jesus is coming back soon. And he must have our hearts. Must. Must have our hearts. I'm alarmed. I'm alarmed at the direction that, that some are going. Doctrine, they don't want to preach it because they'd rather preach about Jesus. Do you know how imbecilic that is? Jesus is doctrine. They called him rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. He taught what he taught was doctrine. You, 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 you can't get by educating your people in your church and you're not talking about the state of the dead, the Sabbath, the second coming, the sanctuary, spirit of prophecy. You're teaching them nothing. In the church, we just want you to have a happy old time. I want you to have a happy time too, but I want you to have a happy time in heaven. In heaven. Jesus is coming back soon. And you know that some will be on the circle of the earth. Yes, here's Jesus. And others are going to be running, calling to the mountains and rocks to fall on them. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Being in church does not make you saved. We, friend, have to have an experience with God. We absolutely must. I remember interviewing a lady and the conversation, this is a conversations conversation, just went this way. And we talked about a challenging experience in her life. She's a spiritual uh, leader, spiritual giant, this young lady. She talked about the time when she was in college, everybody looked up to her. If your kid was a friend of hers, you were happy that your kid had a really good friend. And then her life was shaken. <clears throat> and she quickly got to the stage where she was not suicidal, but she was wondering if there was anything she could do to hasten her own demise. What a dark place to be. She realized that this foundation upon which her faith was built was pretty shaky. And so she went to the Bible and she went to God. She said, what? She started to read the Bible as though God was speaking to her. She started to claim the promises of God as though they were really meant for her. She started to commune with Jesus and take him seriously and pray and trust and trust and pray. Her life changed absolutely and dramatically when she went beyond the daily regular blah to having a vibrant, deep, meaningful, personal, personal, personal experience with Jesus. Without that, you are underprepared. You have knowledge. You know what? We're so glad that your grandfather was a union president. That done mean nothing in terms of your salvation. We're thankful you work for some hospital in the Middle East or in Africa, someplace, working with a church. We're thankful, but we want to see your heart change. That's what we want. We're glad that the church school or the church building project was bankrolled largely because of you. Fantastic. But how's your heart today? Where are you with Jesus, really? If Jesus looks at you, does he see his reflection? Uh, uh, no, you say, but I'm, I'm faulty. Not, no, 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 no. You can be faulty and saved. You're growing. You're growing. You can be faulty and saved because you're looking at Jesus and you're growing. But are you growing? Do you know anything more about Jesus today than you did a month ago or a year ago or a decade ago? Or have you been on cruise control all this time? No, 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 no. The people in Hinckley, Minnesota were on cruise control. Fire coming. A thousand gallons of water ought to do it. Hang around, run in your home, get your stuff. Sure, we get out of here. No, no, no. There's a, there's a firestorm coming. You need to prepare now. Grab your birth certificate and, your, and the photos of your kids if you have time and get out of Dodge as quickly as you possibly can. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil is roaring now.
You, you, you know, I mean, I'm not even going to start talking about the, 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 the specifics because you know what he's doing in society. You see it. It's affecting you. It's affecting your family, your children. These days, they exist just by virtue of breathing in this, in this, in this atmosphere of yuck. It's everywhere they turn. This isn't life as usual. So what do we do? Okay. You remember a few years ago, there was this treasure hunt. People, even from even friends of ours, were traveling to the Rocky Mountains to look for treasure that a fellow named Forrest Fenn said he had hidden in the Rockies. Remember that? Million dollars worth of treasure. He wrote a book. In the book, there was like a 24-line poem. He said, everything you need to know to find the treasure is in there. And yet people were looking everywhere, 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 even though he said, the answer's right here. Well, somebody found the treasure. His name was Jack Stuth. He was a medical student from Florida. Here's the key to his success. Here's what he said. Listen, he was trying to find a million dollars worth of treasure. <clears throat> you know, a million dollars is still a lot of money. There's a lot of money. We have respect for a million dollars. But a million dollars worth of treasure. Now, everlasting life. There's nothing, right? Nothing. I say that with respect. There's nothing compared to everlasting life. He wanted to find $1 million worth of treasure. So I've probably thought about it for at least a couple of hours a day, every day, since I learned about it. Every day. He wanted to find a million dollars. So he thought about it for two hours a day, at least every day. How long? will your devotional time be tomorrow? And after your devotional time, how much will you think of Jesus before you go to bed? I'm just saying, I'm just asking. He said that to find the solution, he would carefully listen to the things Mr. Finn had said in interviews. He said that way he found a few crucial crumbs. One writer said, Jack Stuff made it seem so simple that the key was really just understanding Forrest Finn. He hunted solo, never discussed his search with anybody. After reading the blogs once, he never read them again and assiduously avoided groupthink. He did his utmost just to focus on Mr. Fenn's words and primary sources and understand them as best as he could. Listen to some more. He said, I don't want to ruin this treasure hunt by saying it was made for an English major. But it's based on a close reading of a text. You heard that. I understood him by reading his words and listening to him talk over and over and over and over again and seeking out anything I could get my hands on that told me who uh, he was. That's the Christian life right there, isn't it? A close reading of the text, learning again and again and more and more just who he really is. That's what God has called us to. That's the solution for preparation for the return of Jesus, to practice Christianity, to know our faith and to know Jesus and to go to the Bible, even when it seems boring and read it anyhow, to fall on our knees and pray, even when we don't feel like praying and pray anyway to ask God every single day. Is there some way today that I can share my faith? You don't want to become a shell of a Christian. You don't want to be a Christian in name only. Jesus died for you. You want to receive every single day the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did you, rhetorical question now, did you today ask that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit? If not, what you said to God was, I'm fine. I can face this day on my own. I don't really need you. You might have said, God bless me and thank you for Jesus and please bless the missionaries, which we should pray. But if you didn't say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit today, you did not say, I actually want to be a living, breathing Christian driven and impelled by the presence of Jesus within my life. So tomorrow you'll pray that prayer and then you pray it the next day, not my will, thy will be done. 
I had a boy of four or five years of age this weekend tell me that every single day he prays, Jesus, come into my heart right now. I'm just promising you that boy's going a long way if he keeps praying that prayer because he understands Christianity. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Amos, after God speaks directly to Israel, he says this, I sent this, you didn't turn. I sent this, you didn't repent. I sent this, yet you didn't come back to me. But then he says, he says to a people who are failing dismally, and that might be me, it might be you today. He didn't say you failed, so I'm done with you. He then turned to them and he said, let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And you understand what he said. He didn't say force it to happen or conjure it up. He said, let it happen. That friend is our faith today. Jesus is coming back. We have a time of trouble coming. We have a, a Jacob's time of trouble. We have the mark of the beast coming. No one's going to be able to buy and sell. There'll be all kinds of things that take place. How do we be ready? We let Jesus work in our lives. That's it. Jesus, today my heart is yours. Take it and make it yours. Jesus, today my will is yours. Take it and make it yours. Jesus, today I could go left, I could go right, but I want to go where you lead me to go. Oh, friend of God, that's what God is calling us to today. An experience with Jesus, with Jesus, with Jesus. This Jesus crowned with thorns, you want him in your life. This Jesus hanging on a cross saying, I love you this much. You want him as your Lord and as your Savior. This Jesus who went about doing good, you can't spend a day without him in your life. This Jesus who healed the sick and raised the dead, you say, Jesus, you got to heal my sin sickness and raise me from the, the deadness of sin. This Jesus, cursed as any man who hangs on a tree. This Jesus who became sin for us. This Jesus crucified, dying a lonely, ignominious death. This Jesus, the Bible says, has engraved your name on the palms of his hands. He thinks of you every time he sees those wounds, and he thinks of you other times as well. What are we going to do? The, 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 the Bible is clear. Christ is coming back. He's going to come back soon. Before that, a time of trouble such as never was. I don't fear that. I don't waste any energy at all fearing that. But I've thought about that, and I've had a conversation with God, and I said, if you expect me to stand, I cannot unless your will is done in my life. That's today. That's tomorrow. That's the next day. They, they were bitten by snakes. They were dying. Moses put that snake on a pole and said, look. And they looked and they lived. Because when you look at Jesus, you have life. When you turn your life over to Jesus, you have life. Friend of God, he's coming back soon. And we must be ready. Better news yet, we may be ready. Better news yet. If we continue to exercise faith in the divine Son of God, we will be ready. Our readiness depends on our connection with Jesus. Our connection with Jesus depends on our willingness to let him connect with us and take a little more of us every day, a little more of us every day to grow us into what we could never be without the interposition of the divine Son of God in our lives. He is coming back soon. He has done everything to save us. Now we let him save us. Whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Another time Jesus said, your problem is you won't come to me that you might have life. That's the human problem. That will come to other things and other teachings and other stuff instead of coming to Jesus that we might have life. And I gave my heart again to Jesus. Why'd you do that? Because he died for me. That's all. Yeah, and he, and he lived for me. And he was raised from the dead for me. And he, and he ministers for me at God's right hand. And though I'm weak, he loves me. Though I have sinned, he forgives me. Though I, my sins nailed him to the cross, he has said, let judgment run down as, as, as water in your life. He said to me after my repeated failures and my repeated mistakes, I'm not done with you. The best is yet to come. But I really messed up again yesterday. But Jesus didn't turn from me. I, I accepted Jesus in my heart again. You know, when I left, I left knowing that in spite of myself, I'm a saved child of Almighty God. And we come here knowing that we're pointing towards the greatest family reunion. And if one of us is not there, all of us will feel that keenly, keenly. 
Oh, friend, we've got to find Jesus today. Who is Jesus? The divine Son of God. Who is Jesus? The Savior of the world. Who is Jesus? Our heavenly high priest. Who is Jesus? Our soon coming king. Who come riding down the great corridors of space on his vesture and on his thigh and name written. What is it? King of kings and Lord of lords. We have to find Jesus today. So as we pray in closing, why don't we pray and ask Jesus if he would fill us, our hearts with his presence. And make us more than rule keepers. Make us more than time servers. Make us more than men pleasers. Why don't we pray that he would make us Christians? Can you pray with me now? Father in heaven, in the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks to the church of Pergamos. Is it? No, no, no. It's Ephesus. He says, you left your first love. Today, dear father, we ask that you would give to us a first love experience. We have been blessed this weekend. Our souls have been watered. Friendships have been strengthened. Family bonds have been renewed and strengthened. We've talked about ministry and mission. So many people have given so faithfully and sacrificially. Our hearts have been touched by what we've experienced, but our hearts, we could go away from here touched and yet empty. Please don't let it be so. Let us go from here touched and filled. Filled with your spirit. Oh, I know we got a long way to go. But fill us as much as you can with love for the God of heaven. With a burden for souls. Uh, a, a determination that by your grace will spend time in your presence and will see your face. And will be prepared for that wonderful time that is coming when Jesus comes back. You've got to hold us in the hollow of your hand. So do so, please, we pray. Friend, is it your prayer? Jesus, fill my heart. Simple prayer. If it is, would you raise your hand? Not a person is watching other than God himself. Would you please, would you raise your hand and, and say, Jesus, fill my heart. Simple. A gathering of the saints. But we're not all saints. That is some of us struggling this weekend, some of us doubting this weekend. Maybe somebody at the end of their rope ready to give up. God is waiting for you to say, Jesus, fill my heart. Would you do it? Raise your hand. Jesus, fill my heart. We have prayed that little prayer as seriously as we know how. And we pray now, please do it for your glory. And we believe you will. And we believe you have. And so, go, so we go from here in confidence in our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is number 618. Stand and sing with me.
Dear Lord, we ask that you would take our hearts and fill them with your spirit. And Lord, give us a willing heart to follow the direction that you give to us. Lord, help us to be a people that will bring honor and glory to your name in this time, in this hour that we live and to be faithful until Jesus returns is our prayer in Jesus' name.